Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Virtual Desktops, should you be doing it and if so, why? Many organisations are now moving to the cloud in order to virtualise their environment. However, they didn't get there overnight. Multiple service requirements including infrastructure, software, maintenance and licensing and delivery and also cost models are just some of the things that need to be considered. Today's webinar will address these and many more. Okay, let's get started. I'd like to welcome our host for today, Bruce Allison. Bruce has provided on-demand technology solutions for over 18 years to SMB, multinational enterprise and government organisations across multiple platforms, communication channels and applications. He recently founded Comms Cloud, a procurement hub for on-demand technology with a panel of suppliers for communication channel solutions and virtual desktop. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Bruce. Great. How are Thanks, you? Thanks, Sarah. Great. Let's get started. Hi all, welcome to the uh, webinar on virtual desktop. Uh, today one of my panel suppliers, Steve Moran from MapEx, will talk all things virtual desktop. I've known Steve for 14 years and he's never let me down. Uh, he's a specialist in networks, infrastructure, SaaS based applications and in cloud based virtual environments. He's going to provide an insight into the virtual desktop world and talk all things virtual desktop pros and cons. But I'll pass it over to Steve to kick it off. Hi, Steve. Hi, Bruce, and good morning. And good morning, everybody uh, on the webinar. Uh, so today, um, I'm going to be talking a bit about virtual desktops and sort of demystifying uh, the, um, the, the whole area of uh, virtual desktops and how you would use them. Uh, I guess you know, I'm try I'll try not to uh, put too much jargon in here and show you some of the practical uses um, and some of the, the pros and cons, uh, the benefits and to where it may be not, not applicable to use a virtual desktop. So the agenda today um, that we're going to go through is that we're going to talk about what is a virtual hosted desktop and, and how does it work, um, what, why I'd want to use one of these virtual desktops and um, uh, the benefits that it may have. Um, and talk about the changing environment of, of the IT workplace, about where people work from, uh, how they work, what devices they use to work. Uh, and then talk a bit about if um, uh, you're interested in, in the path um, and how you actually uh, adopt virtual desktops within your own environment. And lastly, um, to give some uh, an overview of who MapEx are and how we uh, provide this service and um, the partners that we work with. Hi guys, uh, so I suppose the first question we're all asking is uh, uh, what's a virtual desktop? Yeah. Okay, well, so a virtual hosted desktop, quite simply, it's, um, it's just a, a regular Windows desktop. There's nothing uh, special about it. It operates in exactly the same way. Uh, you have uh, start buttons, you have folders, um, everything that you would have on your local PC. Uh, there, are, there are some differences though in that the, um, the actual desktop uh, and the network around it are, are hosted remotely. Um, and when I talk about the network around it, that's things like file servers, things like web servers, uh, other ancillary servers that you use in your normal course of business, um, they're usually hosted with, with that desktop. Um, and that desktop is usually hosted within a data center. And the way that you access and interact with that desktop is usually over the internet or through a network connection. Um, now these desktops, they, they can be hosted internally. Um, there are lots of uh, large enterprise customers that have moved to this model to simplify the management of their desktops. Um, or in this case, we're today we're talking about hosted desktops and they may be hosted via, via a service provider, you know, somebody like MapEx. I guess the key thing about, about virtual desktops is where the data is located, is, is that it moves the data being located on your physical hard drive um, to be to be hosted remotely with with that desktop. So hosted within the data center or uh, or somewhere with it within the cloud. So there are a few elements to um, the actual makeup of, of a desktop and, and a hosted desktop service. There is the obviously the, the Windows operating system which is is the um, 
uh, the core of, of, of the desktop and that's you know the same Windows operating system that you would use on your, on your local desktop. Um, there is um, LOB there, which stands for Line of Business Applications. Like every business, you know, whatever vertical they're in, they have applications which are specific to that vertical. So whether you're in real estate and you've got an application that deals with buyers and sellers of properties and a CRM, or whether it's you're in mortgage processing and it's to deal with um, uh, how you how you interact with your lenders and your brokers, um, people will have these Line of Business applications. Um, then with that, there's things around office productivity, and that's you know your typical uh, Word, Excel um, uh, productivity suite. It's not limited to just Word, Excel. Obviously, Google have their version of that. Apple have their version of that as well. Um, and you know the the, the core around uh, every workplace today is email, and it uh, includes an element of hosting that email, so you don't have to host it uh, yourselves. And then there's other things such as disaster recovery and data storage and backup and, and the actual services that um, are consumed around IT, things like uh, updates and patching and antivirus and the likes. So essentially, a virtual hosted desktop, it differs slightly to, to, to your normal desktop because of that, um, uh, that remote element. So um, obviously, it, it's within the data center, so it's, in, it's usually housed in something called a private cloud. And, and the easiest way to think of this is this is uh, like your fenced-off area of, um, the, of, of a network that has security around that perimeter, around that fence, and your data and your application, uh, applications are, are housed within it. Uh, you access those um, applications using um, instead of you can use a traditional PC, but um, now you have a, a plethora of other options in terms of accessing those desktops. You can use uh, smartphones, you know, whether that's an iPhone or an Android phone or a Windows phone. Uh, you can use tablets and, and um, so iPads and, and Android tablets. But also there's another device called the Thin Client that uh, is like a cut-down version of a PC. Uh, that you know doesn't necessarily have hard disk in there, and you don't use it to save data within it. It's just uh, like a DOM terminal. Uh, the other element here, and I'm going to go into each of these, is is what the service provider does in terms of hosting it within the data center and what they provide. So they obviously provide the hardware, which is the the, the servers and the network and equipment and everything you need to be able to access these desktops remotely. But they provide security around that, obviously, um, within that private cloud, but also things like um, uh, putting antivirus within there and email uh, anti-spam checking and things like this. They provide uh, maintenance around the environment so that, um, uh, you know, with your traditional ho um, on-premise uh, environment, you, you might have IT guys that come in and they do patching, they do updates, they fix security holes, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's uh, backup and, and um, uh, managing protection of your data to make sure that in the event of any failure of devices or systems or locations that you've got access to that data. And then the two other options, which are um, the, the licensing, um, which you know normally in a traditional uh, desktop environment, you'd purchase that licensing, you consume it, and as new versions come out, you'd upgrade. Um, the service provider provides that as well as a support framework to allow you to operate in this environment. So there are two different ways in, the, the, in which um, virtual desktops can be um, delivered. Um, there's something called public cloud and private cloud. Um, and this slide really gives you uh, some of the differences between the two. A public cloud is um, you're in, the, you're in uh, there with multiple other customers. The infrastructure is shared. Um, and uh, you get the economies of scale of, of, of that sharing of infrastructure, and usually you access it over the internet. That's where a private cloud, you're given dedicated resources. So um, you, you, what you don't suffer from is things like uh, things such as noisy neighbor syndrome. So you might have a uh, another customer in a public cloud that's consuming quite a lot of resources. You know they're running their end of month routines or whatever it may be and it impacts on your uh, service and the delivery of your service. A private cloud <coughs> gives you <coughs> excuse me, dedicated res resources. <coughs> the other thing a private cloud um, permits is the, the ability to connect um, over a private network um, directly into the data center. So 
<clears throat> you don't have to rely upon the internet. Thanks, Steve. Um, that, that's all well and good, but uh, why would I want to use a hosted desktop or managed service? I mean, it's, it's one thing that you can provide the services and it's there, but you know, what's it going to do for me? Okay, Bruce, well, you know, going back to that slide I showed before about what the service provider does, um, you know, there's the hardware maintenance, backup, licensing, and, and support there. Um, we'll talk of, you know, through, through a few of those in detail. Like the hardware, um, I guess the benefits here are that instead of having to um, go out and, and uh, purchase server and equipment, um, you know, which <coughs> normally you would have to go out and buy that and give yourself uh, uh, some extra capacity to grow into, you know, as you bring on new users, you don't want to have to just go out and buy an, a, an upgrade your server, you, you, you've got to buy that from the outset. Um, so the difference here is that we're changing that model to, to now you're consuming uh, the, the service on a month-by-month -month basis, so um, you don't need to um, budget for um, those those peaks where you need to refresh your hardware and update it, that's usually the responsibility of the service provider. Um, service providers can also um, offer um, some hardware resiliency. And what that means is that um, if you're you know, a typical uh, company, you've got your file server in your back office, um, it's managing all your day-to-day -day activities. If you have a problem with that file server, it could be a power supply fails or a disk fails. Um, you're going to have some interruption of service so that um, you get a call uh, either the IT company or the hardware provider and get them out on site to replace that and that's going to create some disruption. Uh, because service providers have um, multiple uh, hardware within the data center, they can move um, your uh, virtual desktop environment to different hardware if there's a failure and uh, you're up and running and in most cases you won't even know that um, that that's happened. But oh, Steve, I was just uh, looking at the, the hardware side of things. Uh, what's the actual cost when we're looking at these sorts of um, uh, hardware requirements um, as far as servers and those sorts of things? I mean, what's well, it really going to cost someone? Mm, there's, there's, I mean, there's the cost of it, obviously of the server itself, and you know, servers can range from anything from two thousand dollars up to twenty thousand um, dollars. But, but then there, there is um, the software that, go, that goes with that. There's um, maintenance plans. Um, then there's somebody to come in and help manage that hardware because you know, people want to get on with running their businesses, not necessarily run their IT within their businesses. Okay. So th those costs can be, can be wide and varied, but you know, they're something that recur, reoccur and every so often hardware needs to be refreshed and updated and the costs uh, are introduced again. Okay, thanks. Okay. But um, I guess the key point here is that really the data, and data is the key to everything in terms of a business because um, with, with, without that data, uh, it's going to create a real dent in, in, in your ability to operate it as a business. And uh, rather than having, you know, you know, you could have the best $20,000 server housed in your back office, but uh, if, if it fails or uh, you lose data, um, you know, and it may be that um, it's not that the hardware fails, but um, there's a problem with security. You know, if somebody breaks into your office and uh, steals that $20,000 server, a lot of, a lot of, there's a good chance that the, the data is going to go with it. Um, and you know, you may be, you might have a, an avenue to restore from tapes, but think about the disruption that may cause. So the data is housed within a data, a data center, and usually that's the best location in terms of power. Uh, there's redundancy. Around that, you know, data centers have redundant um, power feeds coming in from the grid. They have backup generators. They have UPSs. Um, the data center that we use can actually operate for up to two weeks without any power to the building whatsoever, and has supply contracts to run on generators past those two weeks. So, okay. um, you know, think about um, if you do have a problem with with power, it's going to have a real impact on your business. Okay, so when you're comparing apples with apples, the infrastructure that you get from uh, a, a virtual desktop as opposed to the infrastructure required for uh, the resiliency and, and backup required for your own business, if you were to have that internally, uh, you'd almost have to have that double up. You'd That's it. You'd have to have, like, um, if you to achieve uh, even just, uh, uh, you know, a, a failover capacity, um, then 
uh, you'd have to have a double up. But as a service provider, um, there, there are multiple servers, so it's you, you know you reduce that risk further and further by the bigger the population of servers that you can move to. Okay, thanks. So the other things, um, you know, that are benefits around hosted desktops, the maintenance is that um, um, usually, you know, you've got to have a, a IT staff. Um, uh, people on staff, or you've got to uh, outsource this to an IT services company, uh, and this is updates and patching. You know, there's, I think uh, the statistics are that if you put a machine unprotected on on an internet connection, it's something like 17 seconds before it'll be probed um, by something on the internet to put some malicious software or, or malware on there. So, all of this a level of protection that you know really is keeping your data safe and keeping your services safe is provided by the service provider as part of the service. Uh, the other thing is that you get access to, to new, new versions of software um, so that, that um, you can, um, the service provider can help with, with upgrades, can help with getting you to uh, most recent uh, versions, but also they can help with things like updates. And the idea there is think about things like MyOB, obviously has regular updates, tax tables get updated every so often, payroll uh, information. Uh, uh, has to be updated, so that, that can be updated by the service provider as well. Uh, I guess the, the theme here is that we're, um, uh, a lot of the legwork of IT is being done by the service provider, which allows you to get on with your business. So the other aspect is backup, and this is obviously um, the, the, um, the, the backup of, of your data and off-siting that data uh, that's provided and monitored via, via a service provider. The off-site part of it is, is is provided there, so there's no need for you know customers to, uh, to think about where they're going to send their tapes or have people rotating them. Um, and the other thing is that with a virtual desktop, it provides a level of disaster recovery. So your site at the moment, um, if you've got your server housed there, if that goes down for any reason or it's inaccessible, there's network problems, um, then it means that your business, um, you know. Has, has a problem uh, to continue. So uh, with a virtual in environment and virtual desktops, there can be access from a, a multitude of locations. And because going back to the, do the data being housed in the data center, there's much more redundancy within the data center that could ever be achieved um, you know, at, at an office site or a location. Other reasons to use a hosted, te hosted desktop is licensing. Um, that, that the licensing is included, and I guess this is this is um, if we think about the, the hardware and updating the hardware, married with that is is licensing, Windows Server licenses, uh, client access licenses, Exchange servers, web servers. There's lots of elements around um, how just the, the basic necessities of operating a, a, an IT environment that have to be licensed. Uh, with virtual desktops um, and the way that um, service providers can deliver um, this licensing, they can deliver it on a month-by-month -month, um, usage basis. So it, it's, uh, that gives you flexibility in terms of uh, you can, um, you know, as your work uh, force expands or contracts or even if you have contractors or seasonal workers, you're just paying for the licenses that you use when you need them. And you're not going back to, you know, you're buying that server uh, for 50 users. You've only got 20 at the moment. But you're expecting to grow your workforce over the next three years by another 30 people. You're having to pay all that cost up front. And you may not or may not even use it by the time uh, it comes to its end of its useful life. The other thing to include is that, that with the licensing is, is included software assurance. And this is a... Uh, like a, a Microsoft component um, uh, that, that basically means that you're licensed to the latest version. So all of the maintenance, if a new version of uh, Office comes out or a new version of Windows Server, you're licensed to that level. So um, in the same way you have to refresh your hardware, you don't have to re refresh the software anymore um, because it's automatically included within the subscription. And, and the last element uh, I'd like to talk about here is the support. And this is the key thing is that, um, uh, th th that you're provided with operational support and the service level agreements that, that, that back that and uh, a lot of those server level, service level agreements 
uh, financially impacting as well. So um, the uptime that can be achieved in a in a data center and and with uh, through a service provider uh, is usually way higher than you can try uh, attempt to achieve yourself. Um, the other thing is you're not paying for IT vendors or uh, people that you have that assist with your IT. You know they they usually charge from the minute that they set off to to go to your business. So you're not paying any of those travel costs and the time around that. Um, you're only paying for a support that you need. So if you have new software that you need to have have installed, um, that that um, you know you, you're you're not paying retainers to IT companies to. Um, just have them there just when you need when you might need them. And the other thing is that there are self-service options. You can have options to create new users, uh, to do password resets. And you'd be surprised, Bruce, how many times um, IT companies are called and charged just because somebody's forgotten their password. <laughs> I know the feeling. So um, I'm going to talk about the total cost of ownership um, of a virtual desktop versus a tra traditional desktop in a second. but I think I'd just like to um, do a poll and, and um, you know, obviously thinking about virtual desktops and what a service provider might provide in terms of, you know, the hardware to run it, the software, the licensing, um, the storage, the backup, the antivirus, you know, all these elements and all these add-ons of, of, uh, that make up an IT environment coupled with things like support is get a gauge, I guess, from the audience as to what, what they think the monthly um, cost per, per user might be for, for a typical service. Okay, so we're just going to launch a poll now. So based on what we've spoken about so far, um, hopefully we've all got a better understanding of what a virtual desktop is and we've seen the benefits. So what do you believe is the realistic cost of providing these services per user on a monthly basis? Um, so we've got the lower end of the scale, which is 50 to 100. So select that radio button if you think so. Then maybe working up around the 1 to 150 and then 150 to 200, or perhaps you may think it's $200 plus per month per user. Um, and this will give us a good indication before we actually move into the actual figure and what it would cost to provide all of these services. Um, so we can see some results coming through there now, um, Steve and Bruce, and we can see the majority of people are thinking they're 50 to 100 per month per user. Great, thanks very much. So we'll stop that poll and we can see 58% um, of people um, are considering or thinking that it's around the 50 to 100, 33% just on the upper scale and then we've also got one person saying 150 to 200. So what is the actual answer? Okay, well um, I'll just move on to the next slide and we have our answer there. So um, the actual answer is that it starts from less than $100 per month. Um, so depending on um, the, the type of software so that you, you might require within, you know, you might have a requirement for an SQL server, you might have a, a requirement for multiple servers, um, then th these will add some cost. But, you know, we're talking about uh, a region of starting for, for a sub $100 per month. But with regards to the total cost of ownership, and I guess this is really where, uh, we, you know, we uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, we, 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 know, we know what we pay every three years or four years every time we refresh our, our IT. Uh, we know how much PCs cost. Uh, we, we've got an idea of, of um, uh, the costs of software. How does that compare to, to a hosted desktop? Uh, and I guess the thing, there are some key things here in that uh, there's a shift in terms of those costs in that there's with traditional IT solution, there's a CapEx cost, the server and the, the software. Um, and then there's some operational expenditure costs. So there's, you know, you need people there to be able to manage that, to update it, to um, provide support to users. Um, and uh, what we do with uh, virtual desktops is we change that to just a pure, uh, predictable OPEX model. So the, the subscription rate per user per month um, is fixed and, and can be um, fixed for a term. And um, it gives you an idea of, you know, rather than having uh, sharp shocks to your business in terms of these capex costs, or uh, you know, a server loses a disk, and you've got to get the IT company to come out and help you do that, and and these uh, unpredictable costs, um, it smooths smooths that out across the course of the period. The other thing is that um, existing hardware, so you might have already, um, you know, refreshed your laptops or 
be part way through that is you can extend the life of those laptops because they're no longer um, having to run the applications that require upgrades. Um, you know, new version of Windows comes out, requires more RAM. A uh, new version of Office comes out, requires uh, you know more disk space or more RAM. Um, th so, so what that means is that because the PCs that you've got now are just becoming terminals into um, the remote desktop, and that the processing is happening within the data center, um, you can turn the life of the PC from three to four years, right up until the point where it where it fails, um, and then um, you, you know. You, People are going to say, well, we still have to replace the machine once it fails. But then you have different options. There are things called thin clients. And these are cut down versions of PCs that, um, that have the client software that allow you to get onto a virtual desktop. And, um, and, and then all you need to do is um, have these, plug these thin clients into a screen, and you can access your full desktop. And the good thing about the, the thin clients is, and the PCs is, is we're not reliant upon what operating systems running on on the desktop or PC that you're accessing the service from, um, because it's the d desktop that's delivered to you is from the data center. The other thing is you might have heard of this acronym called BYOD, bring your own device. Um, I, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but it offers uh, users the choice to use the you know the devices that they're comfortable with. Um, uh, we have you know, lot, lots of customers that they like Apple platforms. They like to be able to uh, to use that. They they don't want to have to use PCs, but they still have to access those line of business applications that were designed around Windows networks. Um, and you know, the, the, in terms of total cost of ownership, there that you can offer the users the choice, and that can you know promote some hardware cost savings. Uh, Steve, I've just got a question from Robin. He just asks. Um, how important does the line speed become? Right. Well, um, that's a good good question, Robin. Um, the the um, if you think about most of the compute that happens is happening in the data center. So when you um, download a file via e email, it's happening within that session at the data center. So the uh, the only thing that when you log into your remote desktop, that's going up and down your connection and, and the line speed that you require is really just when you Move your mouse, press the keyboard, and when your screen updates. So um, the um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about um, how we deliver these desktops uh, shortly. But but the actual line speed, um, you know, you can run a, a full virtual desktop with full graphical um, content on a 3G connection. Um, and and to give you an idea of line speed, uh, we've we've got a customer. It's an ASX listed mining company. Uh, they have explora exploration fields in Papua New Guinea. They actually uh, moved to a virtual desktop from, um, you know, they work in isolated areas um, where they actually have to have helicopters bring USB drives in, work on their data, to operating a, a virtual desktop over a satellite link. Um, and they can work on their data real time, and the actual um, bandwidth that's required is very minimal. So back to our to our costs here. Um, so as I've mentioned, the cost can start from less than $100 per month. And I've just put um, some uh, some information there on a Gartner report that was published that shows you know server-based virtual desktops can represent between a 12 and 27 percent saving over a traditional PC deployment. And that was the link is there to the report, but that basically uh, was saying for a fully managed environment for uh, an unmanaged environment, uh, you know, where where you don't have like a lockdown desktop and users can't do can install whatever applications they want and things like that. The uh, that saving increases to to more than fifty percent. Thanks, Steve. Um, I suppose we're really looking at um, you know the world is changing, and we're moving to a um, uh, I suppose. A more mobile environment. Um, just wondered how that sort of change is happening. I've also just got a question about uh, uh, from David on high latency is an issue. Do you have any recommendation on maximum latency? Perhaps uh, that's something you're going to sure. cover yep. as well. Yep. So um, latency for for uh, 
that just like may explain that term. Latency is really um, the the time it takes for you for you uh, you know for what you see on the screen to transmit up and down the wire. And obviously, the further you are away from uh, what you're communicating with, uh, the the more time that takes, and that's where latency that's and latency is a measure of that time. Um, so. Um, the way that we deliver our solutions is using using Citrix, and Citrix have been in. Uh, I'll talk about this in, a bit later on. They've been in this field for a long time. Uh, the latency um, that Citrix suggests is is sub 250 milliseconds, which is a quarter of a second uh, latency. And to give you a perspective in, in terms of geography, we're talking about sort of um, from Australia um, network speeds that would offer sub-250 milliseconds basically extend beyond Asia into the Middle East uh, to the west coast of the US and probably central US. So um, latency does it does have a bearing um, uh, and, and like I wouldn't expect that if you were in the UK running a remote desktop in Australia that you'd, uh, you, you would notice um, uh, you know, that there may be some lag on the session. But we have customers, um, uh, one I'll talk about a bit later, that they have operations around Asia and they run their full desktop environment th through our data center in Sydney um, over the plain old, plain old internet and have a, a, a you know, as, as good as a local desktop experience. But I guess leading on from, uh, from, from this question, what when, when wouldn't uh, be the appropriate time to, to use a hosted desktop? And there's, I've just given a few examples here. Um, areas uh, where, where there's poor internet connectivity. And this is really, um, uh, you know, think the, uh, somebody who's out on the road and working around regional parts of Australia, in and out of network coverage, not just for internet, but also for, for, for telephone. Um, it's probably not the the, the, um, the best use case for a virtual desktop. Um, obviously, one of the things that, that that is required is some sort of connectivity to back to that data center. Um, and you know, the, the, the um, with with most not non non regional areas and and uh, certainly metropolitan areas, it's very easy to facilitate diversity around that network access. So you know, we 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 have. Uh, tethering from mobile phones, certainly like our, our virtual desktops will work off a 3G connection, 4G, um, you know, we, we, we've had instances where customers have lost their internet connection and they have seven, eight people on a single, tethering off a single phone running full remote desktop sessions. The other thing that might not be a scenario where virtual desktops might not make sense, but there's some sort of direct interaction required with some um, back office equipment uh, or or system, so you know it could be a um, in, in manufacturing something that talks to a, a production line. We need to download a large volume of data to it, you know, like large print uh, print equipment and things, uh, or telemetry or things like this, where where really there's a lot of interaction required directly on site with equipment. That's not to say that you that everybody can't use hosted desktop. You can operate in a hybrid mode where you've got both uh, both virtual and um, non and physical desktops. Other things you should really consider about hosted desktop uh, is really a service provider and the procedures around handling of their data, handling of your data. Um, and that's all about um, you know who has access to it, what the security is, um, how they partition off your piece of uh, the private cloud. Um, and, and also, I guess more importantly, is, is onboarding procedures, but also exit procedures. You know, what happens when you want to uh, switch a provider, or maybe um, you've merged with another company and they have on-premise solutions and you want to um, uh, bring your data back on. Um, it's it's uh, onboarding procedures are, uh, and exit procedures um, need to be considered. So I'm going to talk a little bit we hear about now about the changing environment of workplace IT. Uh, and these are facilitators um, to um, really show you how things are changing in the environment and how virtual desktops can help you with these changes. So basically users, um, you know, now we, we're moving away from people come into the office, sit down at their PC, sit there nine to five, uh, and leave the office, go home, and switch off. 
they want to be uh, uh, they want to work where they want to work they want to work on the devices that they want to work and they want access to the applications that, that they require and to give some context there um, what's happening is that, that that we have you know people are working out of the office they're working remotely uh, they're working with multiple devices you know people often have their, their work PC they have the home PC they have phones they have um, iPads, tablets, they want to be able to work on whatever device they're, they're working and also from wherever they want to, uh, to work from. And the, I guess an interesting statistic is that they're, um, you know, they're using personal devices for work. And uh, you know, this, this um, I guess, brings us into an area where we need to think about how do we manage the data on those devices. You know, if somebody has information, uh, or, uh, you know, company confidential information, on a laptop and it's left in the back of a taxi. Um, you know what, what's what's your uh, risk there uh, in terms of uh, losing information and losing protected information. So here's here's a, uh, a, a chart that really shows um, this BYOD acronym, bring your own device. It shows how and this is some some in, uh, information predictions here from Gartner and sort of where we're at today in terms of the adoption of uh, personal devices within IT and where it's heading. And we can see that really, you know, over the next two years, we're seeing that we're moving to more and more of a mixed environment where we want to give users choice around how they access uh, their systems. So on top of, on top of um, all these uh, issues around how users will access um, uh, your IT systems, you know, we've got the um, in traditional IT, the unpredictable IT expenses, you know, the, the server that crashes and needs to be rebuilt or a virus gets into a system and needs to be eradicated. Uh, we've become reliant on IT providers, um, you know, to help us with everything from changing passwords to updates. Um, usually on, on premise uh, is lacking in terms of business continuity. How do we facilitate keeping our business operational if we have some service outage? And then coupled with it, we, we have that change in work, workplace environment where people are wanting to use the devices that they want to use to be able to do um, uh, to, to work, and not more than just accessing email on, the, on their device. And the other thing is that we want people to be fully productive out of the office, not chained to the office and only be able to be productive once they're there. So some, some cloud trends from, from a small medium businesses from Microsoft. They're saying that basically 71% of, of uh, customers surveyed are, are saying that they need mobile work styles. They need this ability to be able to have people work from where they want to work. Um, they don't have 60% don't have the resources to implement this technology, and and you know they, they they don't want to have a mixed bag of IT providers. They want to be able to go to one person or one company or one entity and help them with printing with storage, with backup, with archiving, all sorts of solutions. And 50% of them think that cloud is, is important for their business. Uh, that's fine, Steve. Now, if we wanted to actually migrate from an in-house solution to a virtual desktop, how do you do it? OK. Well, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, I think um, I've just put some, some uh, tips here. Um, it's, it's really there's, it's not an all or nothing type of scenario. It's not like, oh, I've got to migrate all my IT in there. You can start with basic IT services. Things like backup um, are a, um, uh, you know, they're a, a good way to sort of experience working with a, a service provider and how they can help you. And then we can move on and add um, things like Office. And, and certainly Office 365 is email in the cloud, but it's much more than that. It offers SharePoint. Uh, it offers collaboration like webcasting. Um, uh, and email applications, um, you know, moving your Exchange server um, to, to the cloud. And um, through, through things like Office 365 or even Google Apps, which is the equivalent of, of not having to manage email services and deal with 20, 50, 100 users that come in to work on a Monday morning and say, where's my email? Why isn't it working? Then consider a hybrid setup. And a hybrid is, um, it allows you to keep a foot in both camps. So you can have your on-premise 
IT and, and then look at uh, linking that to virtual desktops and having uh, users in the virtual desktops, um, you know, maybe it's just the ones that require the mobility aspect of working uh, to, to operate first and that will give you an idea of uh, you know, how, how things operate and still give you access to the, to the on-premise things. And, and I guess the fourth step is look at a full private cloud setup with managed servers, so moving your servers into the data center and then having the virtual desktops there um, in the same location to access that data and access those servers. My apologies. Um, so just just to give you uh, some perspective here, uh, this this is taken from Microsoft's Q1 uh, 2014 reported earnings results, and it's a comparison in terms of enterprise, uh, in terms of where they're getting their revenue from. Um, and the grey bar shows you know their traditional enterprise services. So this is the software that they sell, um, and uh, the services that they deliver for that software. And the blue bar shows, uh, you know, from as recent as 2012, uh, how um, uh, the, the revenue that they're getting from cloud services. So it really shows that even, you know, in a very short space of time, that, that the cloud-derived um, uh, revenue is, is, is now more than 50% of, of the, what they receive from enterprise. And in fact, certainly in the enterprise space, Microsoft is selling more. Um, subscriptions of Office 365 than they are of, of packaged their packaged product, um, uh, which really shows you know the dramatic uptake of, of these services. I guess the cost. Okay, so it all sounds well and good, but you know maybe it's not right for me now. Or um, you know what what are the costs of of, of staying where you are? Um, is that the IT spending cycle is going to stay where it is. You're going to have that, that um, capital expenditure that's going to be creeping up every three years. And you know, that can have impacts in terms of uh, you know, business growth and initiatives and, and uh, capital that you may want to put into uh, services that are going to help grow your business rather than costs which are there to support it. Uh, there's less focus on your core business activities. You've got to um, manage your, um, the, the, the internal um, IT uh, and you know it can be anything from SMBs working with fixing things themselves to having people brought in to help and, and the disruption that that causes um, and also you're exposed to those disruptions and those disasters you know the power outages to the building the you know the, the person with the backhoe that's cut through the cable in the street that means your internet's down um, all, all these sorts of things you can mitigate with a virtual desktop. Uh, and then, and then there's the people aspect. The workers are tethered to the office, so you know they can only be productive whilst they're in the office. They can't be productive uh, on their terms, and um, uh, you know. So, and I guess where this um, can have an effect is that people that have worked in this new uh, virtual environment um, and attracting that talent to your organisation, um, they're used to they're used to the flexibility that it provides. So when they come to a traditional IT environment where you have to go to the office and work from the office, or you've got to work across a VPN and VPN slow and drops out uh, because it's having to shovel a large volume of data backwards and forwards. Um, it, you can have problems attracting the right caliber of people. And the other thing is that your competition can gain that advantage. They can, you know, uh, have that. Uh, workforce that they can bring on demand and the costs will only be borne when they bring them on um, uh, and you know it can give them a competitive advantage so I'm going to talk a bit about ourselves MapX systems and, and give you a, a quick overview uh, we're hundred percent Australian owned um, like Redback um, we were formed in, in, in 2010. Uh, we're based in Sydney. We're now launching in, in Singapore. Uh, we have customers that use our services, like I said, ac across um, Asia Pac. Uh, we utilize uh, the Equinix um, data center in Sydney to give you an indication of sort of the, you know, the, your typical uh, big four banks are located there. In fact, um, uh, Meyer. Um, uh, uh, are uh, located in the rack neck adjacent to us. Um, if you've used Apple Siri, it's actually housed out of this data center. Um, this is the premier data center in Australia, uh, certainly for connectivity. 
um, uh, resiliency and uptime. Uh, so we provide managed private clouds with virtual desktop. We deliver that using Citrix. Um, uh, Citrix has been in, in the uh, field of delivering uh, desktop services and end-user computing for 20 years or so and are certainly leaders in the field of delivering um, this remote connectivity. Um, I guess the directors that are involved in the business, we have a 15 plus year history of providing on-demand solutions, you know, back to the dot-com era um, and uh, where the buzz term for cloud uh, was application service providers. Um, both Bruce uh, and myself have been involved around delivering voice solutions, messaging solutions, um, and still, you know, uh, provide those solutions um, in an on-demand um, type scenario. Um, and, and really, I guess going back to that, that poll that we did there about we, um, the costs, um, traditionally, like in an enterprise solution, you know, an enterprise, they, they have had different factors why they've moved to virtual desktops. It's really been around the management and the consistency and uh, not having to, do, to, to have IT staff um, out at every single branch, um, uh, that, that they've, they've moved to virtual desktop and, and the sort of price point for say a 5,000 to 10,000 um, user customer uh, is around sort of that 450 to $700 per month. Um, so really what we've done is we've uh, taken that technology um, and we've, we've made it um, so that we've got it to a price point that's appealable, appealing to small to medium businesses. I guess the last feather in our bow is that we provide consultancy services around cloud adoption and, and that hybrid element where you want to um, have part of your IT in the, on premise and part of it within the cloud. Um, we're just going to go to a quick case study now, just as an example of how um, an adoption has been rolled out. But while we're um, finishing up with this, if anyone has any final questions, please type them into the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and at the same time, while Steve is going on this, we're just going to launch a brief survey which is located on the right side of your screen. So please feel free to complete that for us as we go through this case study. Okay. Thanks, Steve. So um, I just want to talk about um, an actual customer of ours and the scenario that, that they came to, to virtual desktops. Uh, it's a mortgage processing company. They've got 60 staff, uh, five sites across Australia with a back office uh, processes, processing center in Manila. Um, they were reliant upon a single IT provider and uh, through some unfort unfortunate circumstances, um, uh, the, this, um, the proprietor of this um, IT company uh, passed away suddenly and it left them in a, in a precarious position of having to um, uh, first of all have uh, you know, mi very minimal support but also be in a position where they were at risk of losing data or being locked out from, from accessing data because they didn't have access to passwords and things. Um, this provider was working with them in terms of migrating to a cloud type solution. It spent five months and was uh, less than 20% of the way through. Um, uh, they weren't using Citrix to deliver this type of service. Uh, and we were brought in uh, in this emergency situation to help uh, alleviate the situation. So we went with um, actually managing um, there and, and nursing through their, um, their uh, problematic IT solution. Um, across and migrating the data and the systems across to a virtual desktop environment which allowed them to move away from having decentralized data in all of their branches and syncing that and having things that, which were out of date um, uh, or not synced properly to running it within a central location and having people running from overseas in Manila to access that. And the result was that they removed the risk position of using that small IT provider uh, they increased their reliability and their uptime. Um, they improved the desktop experience for, for all of the users, including the users within Manila who were having frequent dropouts. And, and they um, now have a, a scalable and predictable IT cost per user. They know exactly when they bring on a new member of staff, what that means to, to, to the bottom line. 
Can I just ask a question with this, Steve? Um, obviously, when this does happen or any sort of change in organisation may affect different people at different levels and in different departments, um, is this something that the IT department just makes a decision on and rolls out automatically or what sort of impact can it have in other departments when making such a change like this? Well, the, um, thanks, Sarah. The, well, the, the impact can be, um, uh, you know, for those benefits that we talked about, the, the whole mobility mm. side of things that people can now work from whatever device they want but um, the, the other impacts are, are we talked about costs as well and really you, you're um, there, there are cost savings to be had in terms of when you factor in the uh, over over the term of your use of your IT uh, what can happen what can happen but I think the impacts is that really you're in a good position to tackle how you know any challenges that your business may have you know we've, we've had customers where uh, they've had to scale down their business. They would have had quite a big infrastructure uh, investment in infrastructure mm -hmm. that would have been wasted, but they can scale down their business uh, quite easily. And we've had the opposite. We've had customers that, you know, through through their success, have grown and brought on more staff, and um, they can forecast exactly what it's going to cost, and they don't um, per, per user. And you know, I guess the thing is, in terms of the user perception, is that they can now. Um, have a lot more flexibility around their workplace and the devices that they use. Okay. Mm. Now I've got a question from JB. Uh, it just asks, how do uh, these desktops, the RDP, etc., fare with video? Right. Okay. Well, um, RDP is a protocol that uh, Microsoft used to deliver um, remote desktops and um, works well, um, works perfectly well on a local area network, but. Uh, is um, if you try to open a YouTube video um, across a, a connection, uh, it'll be jumping and jittering and, and the audio will be breaking up. Um, where Citrix have really um, excelled in this area is they um, can provide that, that and it's all back, back to, you know, users aren't going to use this unless it's exactly like a true native desktop experience. Um, They've optimized the protocol that actually delivers the traffic to you and I've said that it can run over a 3G connection so that it can run with high, high, um, uh, high quality video and audio and work as though it's a, a normal desktop. So certainly the, the Citrix and the ICA protocol, which is the, the alternative to RDP, uh, facilitate that and um, to the point where you know, you can do AutoCAD, you can do Photoshop, you can do things which have been historically very hard to do over a remote desktop. Okay. I've just got another question here about VMware and how that sort of compares with Citrix. Yep. Um, so um, I guess the background is that Citrix have historically delivered uh, things to the end user and everything's been about end user presentation and that's where their focus has been. Uh, VMware um, historic, their, their origins are really around server virtualization and uh, making um, uh, physical servers d do multiple roles. So run a web server, run an exchange server, uh, run a file server. Um, they, they're, they're, I guess, um, later entrants into that end user computing space. And you know, they still, uh, whilst they still have a very good product, um, they, um, they still are catching up in terms of certainly uh, running things like video and things like that across a VMware desktop um, is uh, is noticeably different compared to Citrix. Uh, and, and actually, interestingly enough, um, uh, many high-end enterprises are running VMware for their, their virtualization, but they're actually running Citrix desktops on top of it, mainly because of that end-user presentation. Thanks. Mm. Great. Um, so we've come to the end now um, and we do have some a few minutes for questions. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the message box. Um, but first of all, Bruce, um, before we wrap up, just wanted to um, give everyone online um, a bit of information about this free cloud readiness assessment that you guys are offering for everyone who attended okay, today. Okay, so uh, we've got a, an offer, a, a free cloud readiness assessment so that we can come in and talk to you and look at uh, uh, your own infrastructure and uh, basically where you are on the path to moving to the cloud. Now it may be that uh, you've got servers that uh, you've just bought or, or that uh, uh, are coming to end of life or, and you need to actually do some planning about when you're going to move rather than uh, all of a sudden say, oh, uh, we need to replace our servers now. 
so we'll, we'll mm. come in and actually look at your uh, environment and your operations and talk to you because every client is different and mm. so therefore we have to treat every client as a special case and we come in and we, we basically uh, sit down with the client and work with them because in the end mm. if we're going to be working with them we are partners and mm. we need to establish their their priorities their what is important to them uh, explain clearly what uh, is involved in moving to the cloud for them and mm. this um, cloud readiness assessment exposes that so that then we can really work with mm. people in an effective way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, you know making a change like this is a pretty important part of any business. So you wouldn't want to take it lightly. You would have to be quite consultative Absolutely. in the approach. Um, so anyone who is interested in that, please email Bruce. His details are online. Um, and finally, I'd just like to hand it over to you, Steve, to wrap it up. Um, I think we've all got a better indication of what virtual desktops are, the benefits, um, how to figure out whether or not we are ready and what sort of impact it would make on our business. But um, just closing comments from yourself, especially from people out there who are thinking about making the switch, um, you know, one piece of advice that you would give, give everyone out there? Um, I think the thing is like IT uh, is a complicated field but really virtual desktops, um, the thing I'd like them to take away is it's not complex um, in terms of your use of it. It's, it's basically uh, the same as what you've been doing day in, day out on your local IT systems but now it's overlaid with a lot of uh, different features and the different different benefits um, that, that will really make an impact to their business. Excellent. There you go. Wise words from the master himself. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, we hope you've gotten some in, um, interesting insights and learnt a thing or two. Um, like I said earlier, we will be sending a recording within 48 hours hours containing a copy of the webinar and um, some additional details on our presenters today and also the PowerPoint slides. Um, and thank you both, um, Bruce and Steve. It was great having you on today. And thank you everyone out there for joining in virtual webinar land. Um, we hope to see you at future webinars and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.